Well, welcome to Alpharetta First United Methodist Church. My name is David Walters, and I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here. It's my privilege also to welcome you to worship today as we continue a series we started a couple of weeks ago called The Comeback. Now, before we get to worship, I want to say a special welcome to all of you who are joining us for the very first time. We would love to connect with you beyond our worship service, but the only way for us to do that is for you to fill out one of our connection cards. And the link for that is provided for you at the top right of your screen, or one of our hosts will provide it in the comments section. And we also have some ways for you to connect with us beyond Sunday mornings. We have some digital discipleship opportunities. In fact, we're just a couple of way, weeks away from announcing and opening up a number of longer term studies that you're invited to. We also are in a season of a corporate fast. We're fasting the first meal the first day of the week, which means breakfast on Mondays. And instead of eating that meal, we're praying that God would heal our nation. And you're invited to participate in that. Finally, I want to remind you of an opportunity that we have to serve our community by partnering with one of our outreach partners called Dreamweavers. They're a foster agency right around the corner from us, and they're in need of some supplies. And so if you'd like a list of the supplies, you can go to our website and click on the Serve Now during Corona, and it'll provide you with all of those supplies that they're in need of. You can drop them off here at the church between the hours of nine and five. Just make sure you designate what you're dropping off as Dreamweavers, or you could go directly to the Dreamweaver Center right around the corner and drop up those supplies there. Now, as we are beginning worship this morning, it's very important for us to affirm who we believe in and how we can trust in a God who is never changing. So in order for us to do that this morning, we're going to join together in the historic affirmation of faith known as the Apostles' Creed. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, I invite you to join out loud in repeating this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Pray with me, please. You and you alone are the fount of every blessing. And Lord, it is to you that we bring our praise. We praise you for our lives, for our families and our friendships. We praise you for the work of our hands and the dreams of our heart. We praise you for each and every day you have given us and the opportunity to live each day for your glory. Father, forgive us for those times when we have been prone to wander, when we have been distracted by the cares of this life. Forgive us and bind our hearts to you and you alone, because it is in you that we find our strength and our hope. Your redeeming love has changed our entire life, and it continues to change us each and every day. May our life be a testimony to you. May our story reveal your grace and your goodness. Father, not so that people would see us, but so that people would see you, and they would decide to no longer wander. Rather, they would decide to bind their hearts to yours. Then they too will find the hope, the strength, promise, and new life that is found only in you and through you. Lord God, use us all to that end all for your glory. Hear us, Father, as we lift one voice, one heart, one mission as we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, in just a couple of moments, we have the opportunity and the privilege from hearing from one of our associate pastors, Brad Green, as he preaches week three of the Comeback series. But before we do that, we're going to enter into a time of bringing back our God's tithe and our offerings as an act of worship. The reason that it's an act of worship is that when we do that, we recognize that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. We also recognize that everything that we have belongs to God, and we're called to use it for his glory. And so when we bring back that gift to God through the church, God's able to use that in a profound way and it brings him glory. The easiest way to give at our church is for you to simply text the letters AFUMC to the number 77977. That's AFUMC to 77977. Now, there are other ways to give, and if you have another way that you'd like to give, that's certainly okay, too. And if you've already given this week, we want to thank you for that. But as you're preparing for this week's offering, or maybe as you're giving right now, I want to let you know the eternal difference that your generosity is making. Last Sunday in our services, we had four people express that they were committing their life to Jesus Christ. And if you were with us two weeks ago, and we talked about the story of the prodigal son, you know that all of heaven rejoices when one who is lost is found. And so you get to celebrate together with all of heaven that four people chose to trust Jesus Christ with their life. Your participation in the search party through your generosity made an eternal difference and it brings about an eternal return. So thank you for your generosity. Let's continue to grow in our generosity and also our cheerfulness as we celebrate all that God is able to do through our corporate giving. I'm glad you're joining us today for this third Sunday in the series called The Comeback. 
And during the series in August, we're seeing how that is kind of the way that God works. God so often is in the work of restoration, returning things to a proper relationship or a proper way of being. And we see so often that this doesn't happen with a broad number of people before it happens with an individual. The comebacks through God so often almost always begin with an individual maybe having a realization or an awakening. And then God uses that to impact other people. It goes outward from there. Last week, we were reminded that one of the ways that God can bring us back is through the gift of his presence with us and then the healing power of our presence with others. And today we're going to look at the idea of giving the proper priority to the things in our lives that can bring us back, the things that can shape and mold us as we seek to live a life that walks with God. And as a way of getting into that, I want to invite you to use your memory for a second and imagine that there's something in your life, maybe it's something you can think of years ago, that was important to you and had value at some point but it got put away. It, maybe it got put in storage or it got put in a bin when you moved or redecorated. Uh, for my own life and our family, I think of framed pictures that we've had out in various houses over the years. But maybe uh, in the hurry to get the house packed to move to a new place, we put those in a storage bin somewhere. And, and I imagine some of you, you can think about when you go back into that bin and you open it, maybe after many years, you will pull out something and you'll look at it and you might think, gosh, I, I had forgotten about that. Maybe it's a memory. Maybe it's a person. Uh, gosh, I, I remember that so well and, and I forgot that I even had this. So often those things that we pull back out of storage are packed with emotion and connection and, and deep meaning in our lives, but they get tucked away. And, and then I wonder what it would be like if you reached into that storage bin and and you pulled out a book. And in the same way, maybe you looked at one of those pictures, you thought, gosh, I forgot I even had this. But there's something different about this book or something unusual because <sighs> you realize it's covered over with dust. And that dust gives the impression, at least, that this book hasn't been used for quite some time. It, it hasn't been accessed, it, it hasn't been utilized to shape your life, it's, it's been almost forgotten about. And what if that book was our Bible? What if that book was the scripture that God's given us to shape our lives? Are we giving it the priority that it deserves in our lives? There's something else that a lot of us maybe have somewhere, maybe not in storage, but something we might use a lot, uh, and it it's something that looks like this. Uh, it's that beloved roll of duct tape. Now, I, I bring this out and show it to you because as I think about that image of a Bible that's been put away and gathered dust, I, I remember vividly a friend of mine going all the way back to high school. And he would carry his Bible almost everywhere he went. And I remember at some point in our junior or senior year, I, I noticed that his Bible was much heavier than the rest of ours. And part of why his Bible was so heavy was because he had used it so much that it had literally fallen apart and he had held it back together with duct tape. It was duct taped on the outside, on the inside, on the mar just everywhere you could imagine. There was writing inside and, and pictures that he would draw and dates and things were underlined. And it was incredible to see how different that looks from a Bible that's been put away and has collected dust. The preacher in the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, said this, A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Listen to that again. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. This morning we're going to talk a little bit about that and the power that the Word can have in our lives to bring us back to a place that is where God would have us to be. But I wonder, before we even get to our Bible story this morning, what's your favorite Bible verse? Do you have one? Uh, maybe you'd even think about jotting a note, if you're on our streaming platform, if you want to jot a note in the chat bar about what your favorite Bible verse is, maybe that could be an encouragement to others. For me personally, for many years, my favorite Bible verse has been John 3, 17. Just after 
maybe the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3.16. John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. When I ask that question to people over the years about their favorite Bible verse, there's something underneath just getting at the words that people like or the image that people like. So often what people share in their favorite Bible verse is something about that particular verse shaping them, forming them, changing them into who they were or who they would become. That's true of John 3.17 for me. And I think Scripture has that power. I believe God is continuing to use the Scripture to mold us and to shape us into the people he would want us to be. And we're going to see evidence of that in the Bible story that we're going to read today. It talks about a fresh start on a new foundation. But really, it's not a fresh start or a new foundation at all. It's, it's simply coming back to an old foundation, one that had collected dust but is being rediscovered. So we're going to look at 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23, uh, and I'm going to share some specific verses in the midst of that. But this is one of my favorite stories in all of the Old Testament. It's, it's so rich and it's so evocative. It, it has amazing imagery associated with it. Uh, but you need to understand, and we need to understand that it's in context. And so to give you a little bit of the history, it's about King Josiah. Now, Josiah reigned in Israel from about 630 to 600 B.C., so a long, long time ago, obviously. Uh, This was a time in Israel where there was a divided kingdom. There was a northern kingdom, and then there was a southern kingdom called Judah. And it had been divided for about 200 years at the time Josiah becomes king. Uh, And when he does, and the scripture tells this, there had been a very tarnished history of the people and the kings and their relationship to God. Now, remember going way back all along, they were supposed to be a people that were set apart and to be a witness to God, but they had allowed themselves to drift. And sometimes the leaders and the kings were the ones that allowed that to happen. Sometimes for those leaders, it meant that they actively advocated going after foreign and different gods, idolatry and setting up shrines and and temples that would go against and be a diversion from God in their lives. Other times it meant sort of passively tolerating, just putting the guard down and letting all sorts of things come in and influence the people and influence them away from God. Here's what the Bible says about the king that immediately preceded Josiah. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, can you imagine ever having that written about you? He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. He walked in all the way in which his father walked, served the idols that his father served, and worshipped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and did not walk in the way of the Lord. So we see there was a lot of straying that had happened with Manasseh and then his son Ammon after that. And then we get to Josiah. Josiah is the son of Ammon. And Josiah takes the throne in that southern kingdom when he was, get this, eight years old. But his story is going to be a lot different than the kings that immediately preceded him because his story involves a change coming back to who he was supposed to be. 2 Kings 22 verse 2 tells us a little bit about this. It says, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now, can you imagine that being written about you instead of what was written about Manasseh and Ammon? So Josiah is eight when he takes the throne, and like so many people that are eight, they need to mature into what leadership will look like, particularly spiritual leadership. And if we fast forward, when Josiah is 26, something amazing takes place. Josiah decides to embark on a capital improvement campaign. Aren't we familiar with that phrase? Now, what Josiah wants to do is is he wants to send one of his officials, whose name is Shaphan, into the treasury of the temple to gather up the the resources they have there, uh, the funds, and 
he asks Shaphan to then disperse those funds among artisans and craftsmen, and they're going to go about the work of not necessarily rebuilding the temple, but tending to some of the needs that it had, some disrepair that had taken place over the years. Now, in the process, Shaphan, as he goes into the temple treasury, he comes upon the high priest named Hilkiah. And he tells Hilkiah what he needs him to do. And Hilkiah goes and he's searching for the funds, but he comes back out to that official with something different than money. He comes back out with a book. But I can imagine it's a book that's covered in dust. Hilkiah comes and he tells Shaphan that it's the book of the law. And the scripture says he has found it, indicating that it's been put away for many years, essentially forgotten about. 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 11, it goes on in the story, and it tells us that that high priest, Hilkiah, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkiah, the priest, gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. And then Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king, Josiah, and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house, the temple, and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Can you picture it, him standing there with it? Shaphan then read it aloud to the king Josiah. And when the king Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. This is an amazingly evocative story where we can picture this interaction. As you go on, Josiah receives divine word from the Lord that that if he will be faithful to God, that God will bless Josiah's kingdom. Josiah knows that that will lead toward repentance, but there's a promise of renewed faithfulness and renewed blessing and peace from God. Now, if we go on to the next chapter, 23, listen to what it says about the way Josiah would respond when he hears this word of God, the scripture, the dusty Bible spoken into him. Chapter 23 says, Then the king directed that all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord, And with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord, a promise to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. That's a pretty powerful action that comes from opening the word of God. And then you might ask, well, then what happens after that? What happens next? Well, essentially, Josiah goes to work. Josiah cleans house. (laughs) The word of God when it's opened in that moment, has the power to shape priorities. And that's true for us. The word of God, when we open it and allow it to speak into us, can and does shape our priorities in the world. Josiah knew in that moment that if he and the people under his reign were going to be devoted to God, then they really need to be devoted to God. And that was going to take work. That was going to take conviction. It was going to be a decision on their part. And so Josiah leads them in a collective comeback. His priorities had changed. All of the other shrines, altars, and temples to other deities were knocked down. He summarily went through his whole kingdom and did away with all of them in an effort to draw people back to God. And Josiah does something else. He, he reinstitutes the Passover meal, which for the pe- people of Israel, this was the meal. It was a big deal. The, the Passover meal was a time where they would get together and it would point them back to how God had been so faithful delivering them out of Egypt. It, it would remind them of God's faithfulness, of God's love and care for them. It, it would tell again of God's provision. 
But just like the scripture, the Passover meal had been put aside, left to gather dust. That thing that would remind them and point them to God's goodness, Josiah reinstituted it. Now, for us, it might be like if we were to drift so far to where we couldn't even remember the last time we had celebrated or seen someone celebrate communion. Or when maybe we didn't even remember when the last time we heard of when someone got baptized. Maybe even when someone mentions the word communion or baptism, our children might say, what's that? Josiah brings that back before the people. We've experienced here in this season firsthand the power of what it's like to have some of that meaning taken away from you, the celebration of God's presence taken away from you, the reminder in our sacraments. It's been powerful as we've gathered even in our parking lot to break bread and share the cup together. The people over a long, long time had drifted away from God. And through Josiah, they're coming back. Now, the Word of God shapes our priorities, but it does something beyond that too. Not only or as it shapes our priorities, it directs our practices. The Word of God, when it's open in front of us, can literally tell us and show us and direct us in our practices in what we should do and where we should go. When, when Josiah heard these words from the Scripture read to him, did you notice what he did? It says he tore his clothes. Now, the meaning is lost on most of us, but essentially what that is is a very visual way of Josiah signifying that he was deeply grieved. He was in mourning that the people had drifted so far from God that even maybe under his watch, they had been allowed to be so unfaithful. And so Josiah changed his practices. Now, what brought about that change? Well, it goes back to the Scripture. The hearing and the reading of the scripture in his midst caused him to change. It reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 3 that says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now when they realized the disobedience and how far they had strayed, Josiah did things. He started practicing. He started living out this newfound faithfulness. He pl uh, placed his focus on being a person and on the people, being a people shaped by the word. It began with the change in him, and it went outward to change the people around him. He gathered the people, and they responded. D did you notice what they did when he gathered them? What did they do? They, they did something that seemed so very simple. They read the scripture together. They opened the word together out of trust that it would have power in their midst to shape them. And then he goes about the practice of eliminating spiritual distractions, doing away with those temples and shrines and those things that would draw them away from God. So the word of God has power, and the word of God shapes our priorities. It directs our practices, and then it impacts other people. When we place a priority on the word of God being in our life, it has real power to, to do those things. It, it seems so simple, doesn't it? And yet sometimes we're so much like those people we read about in Scripture. Sometimes we allow ourselves to drift so far, even when the life-giving word of God is right under our noses. I read a Bible Gateway article in the last few years that brought up the idea that true Bible usage is on the decline even when access is the highest that it's ever been. Most of us carry something in our pocket or uh, in a bag with us that gives us access to the Bible practically anywhere we go, and yet many of us find that we're using it even less, or we're using it in different ways. That article talked about the way that we're increasingly using the Bible only in fragments, going maybe to pick and choose the parts that make us feel better for the day. As part of that, the article points out that sometimes we read the scripture detached from its context, that it happened in a time and a place, and we need to know that to fully understand how God is working with those people in that time so he can work with us in our time. 
And then so often it's being used, if at all, in isolation. Separated from community where we can learn from one another and hear how God is using the scripture to inform and shape others' lives. And that that may have impact on us. Well, we can't change what's happened in the past. Neither could Josiah. But we all can change what happens in the here and now. Josiah gives us this great example. He showed strong conviction as a leader when he allowed the word to shape his priorities. It's clear when the word was heard by him, he didn't just take it in as pleasant words. Instead, he allowed those words to direct and dictate his practices that would follow. His priorities were changed, his practices were changed, and as a result, all of the people around him were changed. So I want to invite you today to consider coming back to the authority that Scripture can have in our lives, to the Word of God that can speak afresh and anew and alive in us if we allow it to. Will we give the voice of God through the scriptures priority and eliminate spiritual distractions? Will, will we trust that the scriptures hold God's truth for us? That it tells of God's great love for all of us, going so far as to tell us about Jesus Christ and how God loved us so much that he would come in Christ and overcome our sin and overcome even the bonds of death for you and for me. The Word of God holds that story for us. And the Word of God can speak if we will allow it to. Has your Bible gathered a little dust? I invite you to knock it off. (laughs) Remember that Spurgeon said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we do thank you that you are a God who brings about refreshing and restoration. You are a God of comebacks. Remind us that you are always doing that work in us, for us, and toward us. That you're always drawing us back to you. We confess that it is us who have strayed. And we ask for your forgiveness. Oh God, through the example of people like Josiah, help us to be convicted of those areas where we have been distracted and where we have let dust gather on your word. Give us confidence this morning that as we turn to you, you are not holding that against us, but instead your desire is for us to come to you. Renewed, refreshed. And God, give us faithfulness so that as we move about our daily lives, we may use your word that speaks to us as a foundation for our priorities, for our practices, and ultimately a foundation that will change and shape all people. We give you our lives as you have given yourself to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm glad you've been with us today for this comeback story. And if it's been beneficial to you, then we trust that it could have benefit to someone else. So we want to invite you, whatever platform you're using, to share this service with someone else in hopes that God might use it just like with Josiah to bring something out of the dust for them. If you have a powerful story about the way God is bringing you back to something in this season, we'd love to know about it and hear about it. You can email that to my story at afumc.org. And then you've heard David mention it. We have all sorts of opportunities to open the word together. And even though we're not present in person right now, many opportunities are still taking place every single week, whether it's Sunday school classes or Bible studies. We have some starting up uh, fresh here in just a few weeks. We also have children's ministries and student ministries that are reaching out to those age groups to open the word of God to them. I want to invite and encourage you to take part in some of those opportunities because it's God's way to bring his word to you. Now, I hope you'll hang around. We have one more song to share. And wherever you are, maybe think about singing along. Thank you for joining us today.